So welcome, Grace. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is Grace Collette uh, here on Rexpirations, my fourth or fifth person. I can't remember now. I'm already losing track. Um, thank you for agreeing to do this. Uh, we met very briefly in Vermont, I guess just a week and a bit ago. Um, but I saw your work and was totally blown away um, in the best way possible. And uh, I'm happy to get to talk to you a little bit more about your process and your inspiration because it was pretty amazing work. Um, so welcome and thank you. Um, for those joining for the first time, I'm Robin Whitford from Hooking Outside the Lines, and this is Regspirations, where we get to meet modern rug makers of all walks of life and styles and techniques. And um, today we have uh, Grace Collette joining us from Vermont. Am I right? Are you in Vermont now? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Okay. Um, so welcome. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about where you're from? Like what your background is? Well, I'm a Portsmouth kid. <laughs> uh, born and raised on the seacoast. And my family's five generations there. Wow. So I do a lot of uh, seacoast and, and lake pieces. Yes. Yes, lots of water inspiration in your work. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Uh, so I'll get started in our questions, but as usual, we can explore different avenues. But um, my first question is always, what or who, if it's somebody in particular, got you started in rug making? I took my youngest son to the YWCA because they had an open play area and he didn't have anyone to play with. So I asked if they had any craft classes just so that I could take him there. And they said they had a rug hooking one. And I said, well, whatever. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it happened that I was in my 20s and I was taught by a lady, in, extremely elderly, probably 90s. And so I was able to learn how to hook as they did in the 1800s, quite, quite amazing nowadays. Uh, mm -hmm. Her name was Blue Ball, and her patent said she designed way back then, a still for sale at Cushing. She, oh she had some timeless art. Yeah, and when you signed up for the class, did you know what rug hooking was? No, I didn't have any <laughs> really didn't care. You didn't care. <laughs> no. <laughs> Did you do other crafts? Like, were you kind of like, oh, this is something I'm interested in or just, I just need to do something? Yes. Uh, I've, I've always done all kinds of needlework and has my, my family, my mother, my grandmother, but you know, back in those days, you kind of had to, if you didn't make a pair of mittens, you didn't have one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. But, back then yeah yeah um that is so cool somebody else i've talked to said similar story about how they got started was they were just like i just need to take a class like i need to fill this time slot and that's how they started rug cooking <laughs> so i don't think i would have known you know when my kids were little even if somebody said there's a class on rug cooking i would have been like i don't know what that is <laughs> um do you have a favorite part of the rug cooking process? Like do you, the picking the pattern or making the design or collecting supplies, um, finishing, is there something that you go, oh, this part is the best? Absolutely. What Ruth Hall taught me to do is to enjoy the world. And she brought me out and made me pay attention to the shadows and the sparkle on the water and uh, the beauty everywhere you look. And that right now is uh, translated into several thousands of photographs I seem to take everywhere. And then I take pieces of my photos and make them into rugs. Wow. So, so the whole world is a rug to me. Yeah, yeah, wow. And I mean, when we look at some of your stuff, I. I can see that. Like I can see you looking at the beauty and the, the shiny water and everything, and it comes through in your rugs. Amazing. Um, wow. So designing, is that your favorite part of the process, do you think? Is sort of like coming up with those initial ideas? 
thinking about it. Yes. Thinking, thinking. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, is there anything when you think back on your years of rug hooking, is there something you wish you'd learned earlier? Or it sounds like you had an amazing first teacher, but um, but something you would share with other new hookers um, to save them some stress or some grief about the process or about something you've learned? Definitely. I started reading celebration magazines, I think from when they were first invented. And I, as I was always interested in reading about the people that did it as probably more than the rug. And it seemed to me there were an awful lot of people winning celebrations that majored in art. And I thought, you know, that's not fair. They've all <laughs> studied art and I haven't. And then I thought there's nothing stopping me. And I started reading every art book and composition and drawing and color. And I found that I was surprised. I had thought this was some something that just came naturally to everybody. And I found out that's not true, that you can get all kinds of help just reading a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you only read books or did you take classes on art as well? Or just you preferred the reading? I'm an accountant and I did math all my life and I never drew anything until I retired. I didn't know I could. Wow. Wow. So what was that like? Like what, what had to change for you to sort of recognize that you could, you could obviously rug hook other people's patterns prior to that. What sort of flipped the switch to make you say, I'm going to do this myself. It was easy. The, one of my first pieces that I did, I, I wanted to do a deer for my son. He, t he hunts for white-tailed deer. We've had them in the house every year my whole life. I really know what one looks like. So I bought a pattern and it didn't look like a deer at all. So I started changing this, changing that, threw it out and drew my own deer. <laughs> and I've been drawing ever since. Oh, wow. Wow. Because yes, yeah, so many people I hear, they're like, oh, I don't draw, I don't draw. And I'm like, but you could. <laughs> well, you know, every little kid draws in colors. It's born an instinct in all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what do you think before you did your own deer prevented you from doing your patterns? I was doing accounting. I wasn't yeah. even <laughs> right. You didn't even have time to think about it. <laughs> no, it never entered my head. No, no. Isn't that interesting? Well, and I think a lot of people who get started with patterns have that feeling too of like, well, why would I bother if I can get nice patterns? Um, it's not until the need arises for you to do your own that you decide, okay, I'm going to try. Well, mine are all story rugs. So I think back mm -hmm. of happy times for me and my family. You can't buy that. Yeah. Yeah, that is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, do you have a favorite like material or foundation cloth or hook or tool, something that you just couldn't function without happily? Uh, yes, I like a traditional linen and that's uh, midway between primitive and fine linen. Mm -hmm. and I like a very fine hook because I don't want pain in my hand. I don't want to have to punch at something. I don't want anything except just the enjoyment of it. So a primitive linen with a fine hook is just like running a needle through silk. It's mm -hmm. just process and you can enjoy that for hours on end. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's my, my preference too, actually. I love, I do like rug warp, but if I'm going to use linen, I love just a traditional linen um, and yeah, most people comment on my little tiny hook that I normally use. Um, although when I was in Vermont, I had to get a big fat one because I was doing the torn strips, the class with the really wide. So that was completely out of my comfort zone. Um, so what kind of strip or yarn do you like to use if you're using that? I use uh, all three cuts and then I augment that with uh, buckets of novelty on and uh, all kinds of things that add texture in different ways. Okay. I don't I don't want something just to look 
two dimensional, just flat. As much as I can, I'm trying to get it more towards the 3D. Yeah, yeah. And so only three cut. <laughs> Noel, I uh, I use an eight cut uh, sparingly okay. for for a specific reason. I'll put in an eight here or there. Like yeah. I like an eight around the edge to secure your border. Right, right. Okay. And do your rugs ever go on the floor? Like with a three cut, are you putting that on the floor? They haven't gone near the floor. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking the ones in the gallery, certainly I would never ever think to put on the floor either. But I just wondered if you were one of those that those were for the gallery and then you had others on the floor, but no, you never put any on the floor? Never any, no. <laughs> Neither is anybody I know. No. I think days are going by. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Some people I talk to, they're still adamant that, you know, rugs are made for the floor, but I was not ever on that board. <laughs> I have one rug I did and it's on the floor beside my bed because nobody hardly goes there. So, <laughs> um, I'm but you know, rated hook. what's rated, that? Rated rugs and latch hook rugs. Yeah. Yeah. Those. Those mm -hmm. um, can you describe what rug hooking does for you? Like why you continue to do it after all these years? My husband asked me the same thing. What in the world about that is it that you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I told him, you know, when I was little, the first thing I can remember was for Christmas, all I ever wanted was a box of 64 crayons. And I never outgrew that. Mm -hmm. I like coloring. Yeah, yeah. And do you still color? Like, do you color or paint or do other? I color with all the grandchildren and great grandchildren. <laughs> and I still love to color, but mm -hmm. I'd rather color with yarn yeah. or wool. Yeah. I use wow. worsted, worsted uh, quite often. Looks the same as a three cut. Yes, it does. Yeah. And yet it doesn't fray. <laughs> it doesn't fall apart like a wool. <laughs> do you do your own dyeing then to get the colors just the way you like them? Oh, yes. Quite, quite a lot of that. Uh, if I can go pick something up, I'm happy to. Mm -hmm. But it's so much easier for me to just dip something in a jar and there you go. Uh, I've been doing it, you know, when I first learned there was no place to go buy them so you had to dye your whole whole piece every bit of it so to me it's easy wow wow well i'm just learning to dye and it's easy to make color but it's not always easy to make the color that you want <laughs> or at least that's been my experience um I want to pull up one of your um, rugs that you shared with me and we can talk a little bit about it if that's okay. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see the, your rug there? Not yet. There it is. There we go. Good. So there is so much happening in this piece. It is so beautiful. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Like, does it have a name? Does it, um, what was the inspiration for this? Well, it happens that there's a fellow in the Ukraine who we're all anxious to do all we can to help lately. And uh, he painted that fish in the middle. And he, yeah. paint, he paints on canvas, of course. And then he has prints made of his paintings and he sells them with beads. And so I, I bought his painted fish. I beaded on top of it and then I cut it out and sewed it onto the linen and hooked around it. It's about, it's over 4,600 beads. Oh my goodness. Wow. And it's such, such a different, unusual look. It is beautiful. And those are tiny, tiny beads. Those are called seed beads. Yeah because I'm just comparing them to like some of your wool strips on the side and that's a three cut. So we know it's narrow and they are just like a little fleck almost compared even to the three cut. Wow. 
That is beautiful. Is that something you had done before with the beading or is that um, new with this uh, artist? Dragonfly at the top. Yes. I've done little things like that, dragonflies and butterflies, and I've put uh, beads to go into fireworks or sparkle on the water. So I've put beads on just about every piece I've done. I've never done such a large beaded piece before. And how but do you I, attach them? How do I what? How do you attach them? Like that, the, the dragonfly looks like it's on top of the hooking. Yes, uh, I did the dragonfly first. I beaded through the canvas and then put felt, wool felt under the canvas, beaded the dragonfly, then cut them out and sewed them on after I got done hooking. It's a little different look than the fish. Mm -hmm. The fish I sewed on with a blanket stitch and then I padded it with trapunto. Wow. And that was after it was beaded. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Both of them were after. I, I could, the only time I've, uh, well, I guess I have put beads directly on uh, I've put them on in the water and put them on on the fireworks uh, on top of the hooking after I hooked. Mm -hmm. I tried putting, putting the beads on first and they sink down in between your little wool loops and you can't even see the, can't even see them. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is so effective with the, the fish painted and raised. Um, and I see lots of other techniques with the prati and the sort of fun um, uh, alternate well, I, fibers. I like the prati flower next to the hook, hooked flower. Gives you a little more perspective. Yes. And what is this piece down here? It almost looks like a velvet to me. Is there? Yes, it is a velvet shirt oh. I cut. I know. <laughs> There's a name for it, but I've been doing that quite a few pieces. I make a little pillow, uh, top or bottom, I stuff it, sew around the edge, and then sew the whole pillow on. And I make little leaves that way in different pieces. Oh, what a neat idea. I've never seen that before. I don't think I it's, love... shall we name it? Yeah, we... <laughs> I think you should name it. <laughs> <laughs> the grace technique or the grace uh, I don't know what could it be <laughs> and you know everybody that comes along they reach up and they rub that little leaf yes yes oh I would want to too I, I know I wanted to when I saw your display there was so many there that you just you want to stand back to take it all in and then you want to get close to touch it all and and see all the detail <laughs> um and Tell me about the edge on this. This is another thing I've never seen uh, in rug hooking. Um, the linen sort of very visible and decorated with a different technique. What is that? It's called a Hardinger edge. And that's um, a very old embroidery type from Sweden. And I, I uh, as you can see, I kind of like to to enjoy something different than I've done before. So I thought this geometric design around the outside would be a nice complement to the very organic in the middle. It is. You it can't is. really see it, but I put a metallic sparkle ribbon behind the Hardinger embroidery. And when you get up to it, it twinkles all at you. Oh my gosh. And how is that attached to the backing then? How what? How do you attach the, the whole piece to the backing before you frame it or for framing? Is it sewn on? Oh, the, um, I had it professionally framed mm -hmm. and they put the, the piece on a piece of uh, foam, foam board. And then I, I don't want any glue on any of my pieces. I have heard it that it breaks it down. Mm -hmm. So have them hand stitch along the edge of the Hardinger embroidery so in the same color so you don't see that it's sewed on to the foam core but it is it is okay 
they were very good about, I marked places where I wanted them to tack throughout the rug to make sure that it was very flat on the foam board. And they, they were, uh, can I say the name of the company? Is that yes, legal? Yes, of course, sure. Uh, Hobby Lobby in Manchester. And oh. I can't say enough nice about them. Wow. Well, it is beautifully framed. And I, I remember noticing that in person as well, that all your frames were just gorgeous. Um, well, I think you're going to have art in hooking, then you should treat it like art. So mm -hmm. it should be framed, it should be on your wall, and you should use rules of art in it. Mm -hmm. it I think the wave is going in that direction. I think so too. I think so too, which is really nice. I think um, whether it's called a craft or an art, I had that discussion recently with somebody, but the fact that it is well-respected, whatever people want to call it, um, the beautiful creations that they are is the important part. Um, did this piece have a name? Did I miss that? I, I named it uh, Picnic at the Lily Pond. My oh. dad used to row us down to a lily pond after work. And uh, this is another happy memory. That's my dad up at the top. And my son-in-law carved me a little wooden oar for the boat. That's right. It is. And stitch. Oh, my goodness. There's so many details in this. Just beautiful. And the cattails. What did you do to raise the cattail? Oh, that's uh, Waldeboro. Waldeboro. Okay. I think Waldebro is pretty commonly used, one of the most useful stitches, and it really does a lot to, to bring forward one piece over the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It's beautiful. And actually, just noticing up in the sort of darkest part of the top, there seems to be other metallic flecks. What are you using in there? Well, at Christmas time, you can get all kinds of wonderful metallic ribbons ribbons and yarns and yeah. them very well the rest of the year certainly not as much selection so uh, about this time of the year i can't wait to go out to the yarn shops and the ribbon stores and uh, i that was a uh, ribbon one inch wide i cut strips of it and uh, i hooked leaving circles unhooked here and there through the sky and then pulled the ribbon up through them so cool. Now, whenever I put alternate fi or fibers in, people sometimes are like, oh, but how do you steam it? And I usually just say, well, I'll put them in after or I steam around them. Do you steam your rugs before you put in all these details? No, I, I uh, can't think that hard. So I, <laughs> you never know what you're going to be able to come up with. So I have a little iron, I think it's called a dritz, and the head of the iron is about an inch and a half. And so I go, I put a piece of uh, wet, wet cotton over it, and then I just very carefully iron around everything. Oh, smart. I never even thought of that. I've seen those little tiny irons, but I, huh. Well, this is absolutely, cool. yeah. Yeah, because you wouldn't want to melt anything in that piece, that's for sure. <laughs> that is gorgeous. One of your pieces, and I don't have a picture, I wish I'd taken it. Um, it was something, it said something about joy, but it had like people doing cartwheels. Um, yes. It was one of my favorite um, pieces, I think, at the show, because to me, it looked like that girl doing the cartwheel was going to flip off the page, like she was in motion. Um, and it's a cartwheel, something I've never been able to do. But my daughter, when she was little, used to sort of, you know, go all over the place. And um, I just felt like it exuded that energy of uh, joy and freedom. Um, and to me, that's what your pieces are, like, they're just so full of life. Um, so thank you so much for sharing them with us. Um, I'm really curious, and I, I didn't even think to ask you this before when I was at the show, but do you teach classes or do you share your, your work in a guild locally or how do you, how do you ins keep inspired yourself? Well, I, I teach a class in the local library once a week 
and uh, I do private lessons in my in my studio. And then I'm a president of a group in Maine, and I'm on the board in a group in New Hampshire. So <laughs> I keep at it pretty much. You are busy. Okay, well, I'm going to have to get your information on that and, and share it in case anybody is local and they want to come and take your class if, if you have space. I imagine you're in demand because your work is so unique. Um, but thank you so much. Was there anything else you wanted to share about your work or about the rug hooking journey you've been on? Well, I'm really happy that you're doing this. I think that, you know, there's fewer and fewer people that know about rug hooking. It's not as common as it used to be. So I, I'm uh, all for your whole job there. Oh, well, thank you. And that's funny because I think regionally, like depending on where you live, it really, um, it impacts the people knowing because where I live here in Ottawa, I did not know what rug hooking was. Um, and it was looking online at somebody who was doing something that I thought was painting at first. I was like, what is she doing? And when I looked closer, I thought that looks like yarn. <laughs> and it was, it was Karen Miller who lives in Ottawa. Um, but I had no idea at the time what it was. And when she said rug hooking, I was like, I don't even know. And I had to look it up and I thought it seemed so well, it was primitive, what came up, you know, on my basic search. Um, and so I think a lot of people think of that only. And when I saw your work, like that's, it's in a total different category. Like that's not the same thing. So I think it's important to keep sharing what we're doing so that more and more people can see the variety as well, the potential there, um, that it's not just one style or one way to do things. Um, and that's what I, one of the things I really enjoyed about seeing your work at the, at the show in Vermont. So it was great. Well, thank you so much, Grace. Um, I look forward to seeing more of your work. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for talking with us today. My pleasure.